And this is a good point to take a few questions. We have gone about one hour without questions. So let's take some live questions, then I'll take chat. Okay, SVU College Tirupati. Hello, sir. Uh, my question is on database connectivity. Is that uh, how can we connect the remote databases in a remote location hmm. using PHP or any other language? And what kind of connector connectivity is to be used for that? So the question is, uh, how do we connect to a remote database using PHP and what kind of connectivity? Now first of all, the standard protocol to connect to a database, whether it is uh, local on your own machine or elsewhere, uh, there are several protocols. Uh, for Java, it's JDBC. Uh, ODBC was the standard for C and pretty much uh, all the scripting languages like PHP have their own uh, version of the uh, ODBC um, API. Uh, and they also have some other APIs. For PHP, there is another API called the peer API for uh, connecting to databases. So internally, uh, you know, they provide an API. And the way they talk to the database is using the ODBC uh, uh, connectivity that the database provides. Uh, so that is uh, what you would do. You, so the API for whatever language you are using. And it doesn't matter whether the database is local or remote. You can use the same thing. Now, the, uh, many databases also provide proprietary uh, protocols and tools correspondingly. Uh, so Oracle has its own uh, connectivity protocol. And if you're using Oracle tools, you could use that. Uh, but if you want to use uh, Java, uh, then you probably can't use that. Yeah, so just to wrap up, uh, there are also other ways of accessing data remotely. Uh, there are uh, what are called web services, uh, which in the simplest avatar means you, uh, you do a URL get on a particular URL and you get data back. This is the simplest uh, avatar of web services. There are much more complex versions. And that web page which you get back is not uh, necessarily a HTML page, but maybe you get back JSON data or you get XML data. So this is called a web service where the goal is that a particular URL is invoked with some parameters and the response is not intended for direct display but for consumption by a program. Uh, so instead of uh, low level database access, uh, you might instead use a web service like this and uh, build your own interface to that database to uh, implement whatever functionality you want. Um, so uh, you know, that's kind of what sort of what we do when we build an application. In this case, the end uh, user is an actual user. Uh, the user is interacting through a web interface. Uh, but if the end user were a program, then uh, equivalenting can still be done using HTTP or other protocols. Mount Zeon Tamil Nadu. Please go ahead, Mount Zeon. Uh, sir, my question is, how to touch this, how uh, create a new database and how and where I should start normalization, sir? It's a question we are waiting for last two days. Can you able to tell me about that, sir? Uh, so uh, the question is, when you want to create a new database, how and where do you do normalization? Uh, when you want to build a database for some application, the first step is to understand the needs of that application. And uh, you know the whole process is laid out in the project proposal. So that is part of the sample project proposal document to uh, make sure you follow the steps which are required in building a new system. You don't jump straight into normalization. You first put down what all functionality you need in English or in whatever language you would prefer. And uh, then you uh, sketch out the kinds of data which you need to store. Then you do an entity uh, relationship modeling of that application. Then you convert to relations and then you uh, figure out what all functional dependencies and multi-value dependencies there are uh, and see if there's any violation of normal form. And that's where the normalization process happens. So part of this is figuring out what functional dependencies hold, uh, not just now, but are likely to hold, continue to hold. Uh, if something is uh, not likely to hold, it may change uh, tomorrow. It's probably better to not uh, take note of it when you design the schema because you could get into trouble. Like I said, if you assume that uh, students are in one department, but you believe there is a chance that tomorrow uh, students may be in two departments, you should not use that functional dependency. 
but for our colleges we know pretty much that students are given a department and that's their major so that's perfectly fine for us uh, but if you have uh, some other thing which you're not sure of uh, let's say advisors we currently have only one advisor per student but you know tomorrow that may change we may want to have two advisors uh, then uh, that's not something you want to put into the design itself so don't use that particular functional dependency during schema design after that the steps of uh, normalization you know looking at the dependencies figuring out whether it is in bcnf or 3nf and so forth those can be used as is for the moment let's go back to uh, query processing and then i'll come back to the quiz okay so we saw uh, sorting uh, with external memory and it's pretty efficient uh, today people can sort a terabyte relation in a few minutes time on parallel machines with multiple disks uh, it, there's some interesting history here at one time a gigabyte was thought to be big so they said here is a benchmark called a gigabyte sort and uh, let's see how fast you can sort it now a gigabyte main memory was unimaginable back then main memories were 10 20 megabytes in size and so that was a benchmark about uh, 5 to 7 years after that benchmark was launched uh, main memory sizes uh, grew to 1 gigabyte uh, it was expensive back then but it was available 1 gigabyte memory today of course every one of us has 1 gigabyte uh, on our desktops in fact many gigabytes uh, so the 1 gigabyte uh, uh, sort benchmark turned into an in memory sort rather than an external memory sort so now you have much larger uh, sizes and uh, so the current benchmarks are terabyte but now there are people with a terabyte memory so those have to probably go to 10 terabyte or something so coming back uh, that was sorting now let's focus on join algorithms uh, there are many different ways of doing joins the simplest is nested loops join let's start with that and then we'll look at alternatives so this nested loops join is applicable regardless of the join condition i'm going to do a theta join what does that mean uh, this is essentially r join s on some condition it natural join is a special case of this with projection uh, but this is the most general case this could be any condition r dot a less than b and r dot c equal to r dot d and some function of r dot a is greater than some other function of r dot a comma s dot b and so forth could be a arbitrarily complex condition regardless of how complex it is we can always do nested loops join for each tuple t r in r for each tuple t s in s for two nested for loops test the pair of tuples to see if they satisfy the join condition if they do output the concatenated uh, tuples to the result that is it this is a very simple algorithm and r the outer loop is called the outer relation the relation in the inner loop is called the inner relation so this is very general but also very expensive because it's quadratic so it's not feasible uh, in for any large relations uh, although occasionally there is a very complex join condition uh, with small relations where you are forced to do this but if it's two large relations uh, this is going to be horribly expensive so the next algorithm is an index nested loops join which is actually fairly simple um, the edits i made to the slide didn't make it uh, but just look at this here this thing says for each tuple tr in the outer relation r use the index to look up tuples in s that satisfy the join condition how do we do this the join condition had better be uh, something which the index can support uh, and the most common case of this is equijoin r dot a equal to s dot b let's say r is the outer s is the inner and I have an index on s dot b now for each tuple in the outer relation r I will take that tuple look at its r dot a value I will use the index on s dot b to find all matching s tuples and then output uh, all the pairs that all those s tuples with that particular r tuple then I will move to the next r tuple do this and so forth through all the r tuples so this is the out, outer loop here for each tuple in the relation r so i'm going to skip the details of the join cost um, but it's essentially the cost is the number of um, matching uh, uh, so c is the 
average cost of traversing index finding all matching s tuples. If there are many matching s tuples, the cost c could be higher. So, essentially the number of records in the outer relation times the cost of traversing the index and finding matching records on average which is denoted as c. So, if the index is uh, you know on disk and the relation is very large with small memory, uh, each index traversal could involve some IOs. So, c could be fairly expensive because it may involve on average one or more seeks per uh, lookup. So, index nested loops join can be very efficient if n r is small, but if n r is very large this uh, one seek per outer record can blow up in your face and become very expensive. There are alternatives though which work when uh, the relation n r is large there are a lot of records. The first of which is merge join which is very very easy to understand. So, the first step is to sort both relations from the join attribute. Maybe they are stored sorted in which case there is no need to sort. Otherwise, we run external merge sort and get the sorted output. So, here is the uh, relation r which is sorted on attribute a 1 you can see a b d d f m q. Similarly, relation s sorted on this join attribute in this case uh, a 1 equal s r dot a 1 equal to s dot a 1 is the join condition. So, we have sorted this also on a 1 and now the merge join is very very easy. We simply keep a pointer to the first record here, the first record here they match. So, immediately output this pair a 3 a capital A is the first output. If it were a natural join the two copies of a 1 would be replaced by one copy. So, the output would be a 3 capital A. So, for natural join we can just do the projection immediately. Now, what do I do? I will move this pointer to the next record B. Is that one equal to this A? It is not, it is B, it is larger. At this point, I have to move this record to the next larger one, which is B, and I get BB, which is a match. So, that will be output. Next, what do I do? I move this record again to the next one, which is C. Does it match? No. Which is smaller? B. So, I move that one and I get D. Do D and C match? No which is smaller c is smaller. So, I move that pointer to the next one d. Now, we have a match d 8 with d matches and I will output it. Now, if I look ahead here the next one is m, but here the next one is still d it has not changed. So, actually I need to do a little bit of look ahead to find which all records here have the same value and which all records have the same value. So, if there are let us say three records here with the a 1 value as d and two records here with a 1 value as d all of them match both these match all three here. So, I essentially have to do a cross product of this subset this one matching with all three here this one matching with all three here. In this case there is just one. So, I have to output this one d 8 d n and also d 13 d n. So, two things have to be output then moving on I find f n uh, m f is smaller I move ahead to m m m match that is output uh, I move ahead here to q this one has nothing that is it. So, it is very easy merge join is a very very simple algorithm it is very intuitive if you are familiar with the merge operation merge join is a very simple extension. It is also very efficient you know the total cost is basically just transferring all the blocks and we will skip the details of the seeks. Um, if the relations are sorted it is super efficient, if the relations are not sorted well you have to add the cost of sorting. And the last uh, major technique is the hash join hashing technique which we did not cover earlier, we will explain it in the context of hash join. Now, this particular hash join algorithm is also just like for merge join it is applicable for equijoins and natural joins. What is an equijoin? It has a condition such as r dot a equal to s dot b. You can also have a more multiple attributes being equated. You can have r dot a equal to s dot b and r dot c equal to s dot d. We can sort on these uh, pairs of attributes r will be sorted on a comma c while s will be sorted on b comma d and then do the matching. So, we will ignore those details for now. 
So now, what does the hash join do? The first step is to use the hash function to partition tuples. What is the goal of partition? The goal of partitioning, I will show the figure, is to break this large relation R and this other potentially large relation S into pieces such that at least the smaller relations pieces fit in memory. So, my goal is to break it into enough pieces such that S, S is the smaller relation here and I want each of the pieces of S to fit in memory. So, that determines the number of partitions that I need to create and I will choose the hashing function appropriately. How do I do that? Typically, I have a hash function which generates a value from let us say 1 to max int and then I find the number of partitions I need. I know the size of S, I know the size of memory, size of S divided by size of memory um, plus some fudge factor to allow for non-uniform breakup uh, will give me the number of partitions that I want. Supposing S is 100 blocks, memory is 10 blocks, I will do 100 by 10 which is 10 partitions and assuming some non-uniformity say 20 percent, I will create 12 partitions here. Now, the number of partitions of R has to be exactly the same. In fact, the partitioning function is exactly the same. So, I will use the same hash function to partition R and S. In the case of R, it will be applied on the join attributes of R. In the case of S, it will be applied on the join attributes of S. Now, what is important is that the partitioning is done on the join attributes. And if I had two tuples, one in R and one in S, which would have satisfied the join condition. What can I say? The join attributes values would have been the same. Therefore, the hash functions would be the same. If two tuples at all could match, both of them will hash to the same value i. In other words, if I had a pair of matching tuples in R and S, both will land up in the same partition number. If that S tuple lands up in 1, that R tuple will land up in 1. If that S tuple lands up in 3, that R tuple would land up in 3. In other words, once I have done this partitioning, I only need to match tuples in R0 with tuples in S0. Tuples in R0 cannot match with tuples in S1, S2, S3 and so forth. They can only match S0. Similarly, tuples in R0 can only match tuples in S1 and vice versa. Tuples in S0 can only match tuples in R0, not any others. So, I can do the joins locally between R0, S0, R1, S1, R2, S2 and so forth. Furthermore, this relation S0, S1 and so forth, each of them fits in memory. So, how do I finish that join? Uh, it is described here. The first step is to partition R and S with hashing. We have already discussed that. Now, for each i, we will load S i into memory and build an in memory hash index on it on the join attribute. The hash index will use a different hash function from the earlier one because in the earlier hash function, all of these tuples map to the same value i. So, I cannot reuse that hash function. I will use some other hash function and build a hash index. Now, I will read the tuples in R one block at a time and then consider the tuples one at a time. For each tuple R, I will use the same in memory hash function which I used for S i and locate the matching tuples using the in memory hash index. And uh, I will compare the actual values not just the hash values and assuming they match I will output the concatenation as the join result. And that is pretty much it that is the hash join algorithms very very simple. So, the basic idea is you partition the relations into smaller pieces such that each S i fits in memory. Then I load each S i one, SI one i at a time, load S i fully into memory, build a hash index that is called the build input S. Then I take the tuples of R and probe the index which I have built just now in memory index. So, R is called the probe input and then I will find matches and output them, move on to the next R tuple. Note that if I look at this picture, R i does not have to fit in memory because I am not reading all of R i into memory at a time. Only the S i's have to fit in memory. So, that is it. That is the hash join algorithm. Um, there are some more details in the book which I am going to skip. And the next step. So, hash join, merge join both will work for equijoins and natural joins which are a special case of equijoins. Anyway, equijoins plus projection. 
Now, what about other conditions which are complex? First of all, I said if the condition is too complex, I may have to do nested loops, but it is actually not so bad. Um, supposing I have a conjunction of conditions where one of the conditions at least is equijoin, then I can use the uh, one of the algorithm merge join, hash join, index nested loop join on that condition theta i. And what about the remaining conditions theta 1 to theta i minus 1 and then theta i plus 1 through theta n. What about those conditions? I will use them as filters on tuples that match this join condition. So, it is actually better than uh, what it looks like which means fall back to nested loops join. So, if I have a condition which is equijoin and, and another condition where r dot a less than s dot b, I will first apply the equijoin and matching tuples will be filtered. Okay, let us wrap up the other operations. Uh, I want to finish this up in the next 5 minutes uh, and after the break we can move on to optimization. So, the other operations are uh, all done very easily using sorting and hashing. The first is duplicate elimination. I think it is very obvious that if you sort all the duplicates will come together. The only question is what do we sort on? And the answer is you sort on all attributes that will ensure that two tuples which are identical will be adjacent to each other in the sort order. Once I have sorted on all attributes I just scan and when I see a new tuple I see if it is equal to the previous tuple. If it is new output it if it is the same as the previous tuple skip it and keep going. So, that is sorting hashing can also be done similarly. Uh, the trick here is that we use hash partitioning to break the relation into pieces where each piece will fit in memory. And the trick here is uh, once I have partitioned it into pieces which will fit in memory I build a hash index on that relation as I am building the hash index I will see if this tuple is already present in the index. If it is I will not even add it to an index I will just throw it off it is a duplicate. If it is not present I add it to the index and I output it. So, it is very simple uh, if you if this went by too fast for you um, go read it up from the slides of the book. Projection operation is basically uh, the first step is removing unnecessary attributes the second step is duplicate elimination which we just saw that is very simple. The next major operation is aggregation. Now, if you remember the aggregate operation how did we do it? We first uh, got the records which have the same group together. We had to group the relation. If you recall how we group the relation in our examples we simply sorted it. The moment we sort it all the sort on what is the question. We started on the group by attributes. If you sort on the group by attributes all the records with the same value for the group by will come together. Um, it would be nice if I could flip to the other uh, slide on define which gives an example of the group by operation, but it is too slow switching between slides here. Um, but I hope you remember that we brought we sorted on the department attribute to bring all tuples for the same all instructor tuples for the same department together. Now, if you want to find the sum count min max all those tuples are adjacent to each other. Okay, I hope you can uh, see this example now. Uh, this was uh, take instructor group by department and output average salary. So, what have we done here? We have sorted on department name and now the first one is biology. Uh, then uh, if you want to find the average we actually do the sum and the count separately and we will output the average when we move to a new group. So, the first step is we take the first tuple biology sum is initially 72,000 count is 1. The next one is comp size. So, there are no more tuples in biology I will output salary uh, sum of salary divided by count of salary which is average in this case it is 72,000. So, we will output biology 72,000 moving forward it is comp psi uh, initially the sum is 75,000 count is 1. Then I add 65,000, uh, I get uh, 1 lakh 40,000, count 2. Then I add 92,000, I will get 2 lakhs 32,000, count 3. Then the next one is electrical engineering. So, the I have reached the end of the group, I output comp psi with uh, the uh, 2 lakh 42,000 divided by 3. 
moving forward I get electric engineering 80,000 count 1 that is only double I output it similarly finance and so forth. So, in a single pass keeping just a couple of variables for sum and count I have been able to output the average. Similarly, min, max and so on can also be done very easily using very few variables. If I want to find median or uh, a few other things like that which are called holistic, I may have to load all of these values into memory, sort them and then find the median. Uh, again there are tricks for median which involve pre-sorting this. Um, so, uh, I can compute all the in aggregates I am interested in pretty efficiently by sorting. I can also do it using hashing. Mm, for lack of time I would not uh, cover all those details. Let us come back here. Uh, then there are set operations. Um, oh, maybe I should spend one second on aggregation using hashing. The basic idea is uh, as I get tuples I will uh, build a hash index on the group by attributes and when I get a new tuple I will add to the sum or the count or I will uh, update the min or the max and scan through all the tuples and keep putting stuff into the index. Now, as long as the number of groups is small this hash index will fit in memory. The hash index is on the group by attribute, but it stores the uh, aggregates computed so far some count min max. Now, if the number of groups is small this hash table fits in memory and it is actually very very efficient even I do not even have to do sorting one single pass on the data and I am done. So, it is actually a very good algorithm, but if the number of groups might exceed the amount of memory I have available it gets into trouble. So, then there are variants which deal with it I would not get into the details. Uh, set operations union uh, is straightforward. Um, again duplicate elimination is the only extra step here. I am going to skip details of intersection set difference and so on for lack of time. And what I am going to do is uh, wrap up maybe we should give you a break for there, there are a couple of things more I need to do I am a little behind time. So, I will break here uh, for your tea break.